Thank you very much, Thiru. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank uh, the Agni College as well as uh, all the office bearer of PALS to make this happen. Uh, I know that it has been a long process where we kept communicating, things get busy, uh, you know, at our end, and there are schedules, and then, uh, you know, we had the floods and all of these, but finally it's here, and, uh, you know, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here, and as Thiru said, to see so many young people uh, in the audience where we can, uh, we can kind of share what we do. Uh, just a couple of, uh, so, so I, I think I will take the cue from Thiru, give a little bit of introduction as to what I do and not go straight to the topic. Uh, basically, I am uh, not with the environmental group, okay, but I am with the uh, building technology and construction management group at IIT Madras. So how many of you here are civil engineers? Okay, there's a, there's a fair number of uh, civil engineering faculty. And what are the other disciplines? Uh, computer science? Okay, uh, any other discipline? Mechanical is here or? IT, IT? Okay, so uh, for those of you, so, so basically my area of specialization, if I look at it from my PhD or what I kind of work in is the interface between civil engineering, computer science, IT. So my, my I would call it computer integrated construction is my area of specialization. Uh, I have done a lot of work in automation, robotics in construction. So if you go to my uh, the papers which I have published as research, you will find that we have done a lot of work with, uh, with robotic systems, image processing in civil engineering, artificial intelligence in civil engineering. Uh, so these happen to be my research areas. And uh, are they immediately applicable? When I did these, uh, when I start, finished my PhD, I mean more than uh, 20 years back, it seemed they were not applicable at all. But today as we go in and we find more and more of these technologies are becoming applicable. So I do, uh, so in my core area in civil engineering is in the area of construction engineering and management. So those of you uh, who are going through the civil engineering program here, you are familiar with structures, you are familiar with geotechnical engineering, you are familiar with environmental water resources. The area of construction engineering and uh, management is not a very common area. I think we have only a handful of uh, universities uh, in India which have the discipline at a postgraduate level. But I think this is a growing area. And uh, if you look at the infrastructure needs for the country, I think all of you have heard this time and again, what is constraining India's growth is infrastructure. Okay, so, you know, if you can do, I mean, and you can see for the level of automation that is happening in design. So the structural engineers here, you would have used TAD or something. So what took me to, it took say seven or eight designers to do today, a good designer can do it with a good computer support. The need is in the site. So talking as a construction engineer, if I go to a site today and see what is the level of knowledge of construction engineering and being able to execute a project or how to manage a project, the need, the, you find there is a big gap. And this is where, uh, you know, we have been focusing on several years. Uh, you might have heard of this program called the LNT Build India Scholarship. I don't know whether your students have heard of it. It's been a program which we've been doing with Larsen and Tubro for the last nearly 20 years. So there will be an exam held probably by end of February. I think the application's already due. They will select about, today they select about 120 students to undergo a master's in construction technology and management. And you get a job with LNT after that and then you get placed on anything from a transmission line project to a dam project, to road, to hydrocarbon, whatever needs construction. And cons by the way, construction engineering is not civil engineering. It can be civil, mechanical, or electrical. If you need a power plant constructed with a switchyard, you need electrical engineering expertise. Okay, so we tend to be the coordinators of this program, and today the program is in IIT Madras, IIT Delhi, NIT Trichy, and NIT Suratkal. And what? guess what? Last and Tubro is not happy with this. They want even more engineers to be trained under this program and they're looking for universities which can host this program. So we are hoping IIT Bombay will come on board because they have our faculty in this area and then it might go to more institutions. Uh, I think that I can go on on this, okay? This is my core area of construction uh, engineering and management, I think, but I think I'll stop with that and probably, uh, you know, if there are any questions on this later, please ask me. Uh, you know, we, we, we do a lot in this area. And uh, what I'm going to do is now, I think, move on to my topic. So I'd, will I be using the presentation? Yeah. Uh, I think the projection will come. So now, before I start, I would, uh, I think, uh, 
you all have been introduced to me. I am not going to be giving this whole talk. Uh, I am I'm giving this talk along with Nagesh. I would like Nagesh to come up uh, here with me. Uh, so Nagesh is, uh, I'll give you a brief. Uh, so Nagesh works, we work together to implement what has happened here. So like, uh, like it was said, there is uh, industry side to it. Oh, thank you. From I, can you hear me? No? Might be I'll have to come back to the other mic. In the back? Yeah, now I think it's clear. So, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, so Nagesh, we, we work together on this project. So Nagesh actually uh, is the inspiration behind the implementation of this project. And he knows more details on how it's implemented. We, like I said, we are from the academic side, more on the theory. And I will present more the theoretical issues and how we took it to implementation. Nagesh will talk about the details of the implementation. Nagesh actually has a very, uh, uh, has, has a long, has a much more colorful resume than I have. So Nagesh got his uh, undergraduate degree from IIT in 1988, B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering, got his master's from the University of Hawaii, worked in the area of robotics, image processing, IT for many years, and then he decided he is going to come back to India and actually go live in a village and become a, take up to agriculture. Nagesh, I want you here. Okay, because, no, no, so, so, and then uh, might be Nagesh did this for several years, and then probably 2005 when we met, he came up with very interesting issues from the village. And since then, we've been working together to try to see how to apply technology to these issues in the village, and while we develop technologies in IIT, Nagesh actually takes it, implements it, and sees whether it works or not, comes back. So we have been the team that has been doing this. And in addition to both of us, we have at least another four or five faculty in IIT who are interested in this. So we are here representing IIT together, but please realize there's a bigger team. And also, I mean, we have uh, groups which develop the application in other places. So there's a fairly large group that works with this. And uh, I, what I want to bring out here is it's never a one-man effort or anything. Teamwork is something you have to learn. Collaboration, getting the right things from the right groups to be able to do. And so I will present the first part of it, and Nagesh will be presenting the second. <clears throat> OK, uh, I think I'm going to be here. So I'm, I'm kind of going to start, uh, start with this. Uh, by the way, the guys in the back there, can you even see this? Can you see? Huh? Oh, that's fine. Well, if you can't, I'm expecting you to fall asleep, OK? <laughs> So this is normally what I do is if I'm in a class and you are in my class, I would bring you to the front bench, the guys in the back. But I'll, I'll let you guys go this time uh, with, with whatever it is because I can't see you. So I'm not sure whether you can see what, all the text that's going to be here. OK, I'm going to get started. Uh, I'll use a keyword here, sustainability. Are you all familiar with the term sustainability? Yes? What, do you, what does it mean to you? What is sustainability? What do you understand by sustainability? Anyone? Why, why, why should we be concerned about sustainability? Or at least, what is sustainability? Why, why are we concerned about it? Yes? Something, yeah, that is a very good definition in terms of a dictionary. Something, if you sustain, it will last for a long duration. So in fact, I've had, uh, I mean, when we started work on sustainability, uh, sustainable development, so we, call, we, we then, I will change it, I will kind of uh, modify it a bit and say not just sustainability, but sustainable development. What is sustainable development? Okay. Pardon? Okay. OK, I think many of you have the idea. But basically, what we have been doing, as we have been developing, India is a developing, all, all the, as the world has been developing, are we using our resources in a sustainable manner? Can we continue to use resources in the rate we are using? No. no. If you take, for example, uh, so what are the typical resources we look at? OK, one of the key resources, when a lot of people talk about sustainability, they talk about energy. How much energy does do we consume? So what happens if we consume more energy? What is happening to the planet? In India, specifically, most of our energy comes from 
thermal power, coal. If I'm going to consume more and more energy, it means I have to burn more coal. It means my coal gets depleted. It means there's more pollutants in the atmosphere. It means there can be global warming. It can means there can be sea level rise. So this is a cycle. So a lot of times people look at energy sustainability. We have, I don't know whether you're aware, you must have heard of carbon footprint. Please look these up. These are very important. Carbon footprint, we look at embodied energy. There's a lot of focus on energy as a sustainability indicator. So if you look at an Indian, an average Indian citizen and an average American citizen, the American citizen probably uses 60 or 70 times more energy than the Indian. Now, as we want to become a developed country, do we think that when we move to being going up on the development scale, we should also use 60 to 70 times more energy? No. America is about 300 million people. We are going to be more than a billion people. And if all of us start using the kind of energy they are using, the earth will just die. OK, same thing. If the Chinese also start using, between India and China, we are, you know, we are, we are what? Yeah, 40, yeah, one third or more of than the global population. So we just cannot work work in that mode. So while a lot, so in fact, we are doing a project with the cement industry, finding how is sustainability in the cement industry uh, taken care of. Everybody focused on energy, 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 energy. Then you can say that, look, if I go to nuclear power, might be it's more sustainable than thermal uh, power. So we have all these stories, but one thing that people have been missing, or I won't say missing, but one, one resource that does not get an attention when we talk about sustainability is water. Okay, so we, we, I mean, do you realize how important water is to, to what we do? So today, if I want drinking water, it's here. I don't have to think twice. Okay, we are able to, probably we pay more for the water than for the bottle. Okay, I don't put it in glass bottles anymore. We put it in plastic, we throw it away. In fact, we want to really find how much the carbon footprint of each of these bottles are. So for this water to get to me here, what was the supply chain? It didn't come from this compound. It came from I don't know where. But if I take the energy it took to get this water here, it's quite a lot. Okay, so some of you can actually see whether just doing this is sustainable or how should I get water. But coming back, today we will find that water, do we have a water problem in Chennai? Yes, the floods have relieved it somewhat, but otherwise we always have a water problem. Okay, how, what, is the, what do you think the extent, how many of you are from a village or from an agricultural background? Okay, few of you. Do you have water problems there? No? But that means you must be close to a good river basin. River, okay? But you will find that in our country, probably only one third of the agricultural areas can be served by by rivers. Okay, the remaining agricultural areas are, are rain fed, which means at the end of the rain, if you have stored enough groundwater and surface water to feed the agricultural requirements, you have water. Once that water dries up, you're gone. So, if you look at, so now, uh, okay, so I've got the slides up, so let me, let me, I'll move on to this, but do you, uh, when, I, when we say urbanization, what do we mean? Okay, it means that more people are moving from rural areas to urban areas. Chennai was what, six million people, it's become eight million, it's going to grow and grow and grow because people from rural areas are moving to urban areas. Why are people moving from rural areas to urban areas? Because there are jobs in urban areas and they cannot sustain their livelihood in a rural area. If I work in a rural area and I'm doing agriculture, if my rains fail one year, I don't have anything to eat, I cannot live. If I come to an urban area, I will at least get uh, 200 rupees uh, a day for doing something and I can at least eat and live. So you'll find that as, there, as the productivity in rural areas are getting lower and lower, people are moving into urban areas. Okay, and our urban sprawls are getting bigger. Intense urbanization, rural areas, there's nobody to do agriculture. And this transition, if it doesn't stop, we are going to have very large cities and almost no food. Okay? We have a lot in the agricultural policy also. So, uh, is there a slide change?
magazine this week. Oops. Slide changes. Okay, okay, okay. So, so what we wanted to do, so here if we take the title of our talk here, it's mobile and web-based open source GIS for watershed management. So we are, I would like to use the keyword here, watershed management here. So the talk is primarily about how we are trying to improve water utilization in rural areas and try to get better use of water so people there can be productive, people can actually stay and do farming there. So we have a lot of stories between us. I can give you the perspective from a more urban person. Nagesh can give you the perspective from both the urban side as well as the rural side. Next slide, please. Okay, so the story kind of starts with this. Okay, we are in, uh, we are in this village, okay, Palaguttapalli, which is a village which Nagesh is from. It's fairly close to Tirupati, and you can uh, kind of see it on the map here. Okay, fairly close to Tirupati. You can't see Tirupati will be somewhere here on the map. Next slide. Ah, Tirupati is here. Next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, so we, here we go. Okay, this is the village. It's fairly close to Chennai, so we have access to the village. Next slide, please. Okay, and what has happened in this village, like I've been saying, is that agriculture has collapsed since 2002. That has been, there's been no water to sustain agriculture. If it rains well that year, where is agriculture? If it doesn't rain well that year, everybody starves. And slowly, I think when I visited this village, I find that there is one generation, the older generation of farmers are still in the village. The children of the farmers are not in the village. They have been sent away to the cities saying that you have no future if you stay in the village, please go and do something. Which means there is slowly within, two, within the next generation, that whole community will be gone. And there will be nobody to do agriculture. Might be we have to automate agriculture or something, but that's not what we want. So basically, the agriculture here has been just collapsing. Next slide. Okay, it used to be a thriving agricultural area. And the, to be able to do this, you need water. Without water, you know we can't do this. If you are fortunate to have your fields close to one of the, you know, whether the Krishna or uh, you know, the Godavari or something, great. West Godavari district, you have a lot of agriculture, or if in Tamil Nadu, Kaveri, all of that you have. But if you're away from these big rivers and you don't have sustaining water supply, you're, like we said, depending on the, on the weather. Next slide, please. Okay, now, the biggest problem has been the over-exploitation of water. So if I don't have water on my, in my lake, what do I do? I go, I go to and dig a well. I can dig a shallow well, very good. I remember when, uh, when uh, we were living in, in uh, Chennai, or uh, we are living in Chennai, in Adyar, you could have a shallow well, water would be at seven, eight foot depth, you could get water. In, 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 in Chennai itself, that water dried out. Okay, about 15 years back, what did we do? We put a bore well. The farmers do the same. Okay, they start with a basic shallow well, put a low end pump and then Water runs out, they start putting bore wells. And now as you put bore wells, you are now going deeper and deeper into the water table and pulling water out. How much water should you be pulling out? The farmer doesn't know. So long as water is coming, he is pumping out. How much electricity do the farmers pay? They don't pay electricity, for electricity. Because for agriculture, electricity is free. Which means if I leave my pump on, it keeps depleting the groundwater. So over the years, okay, the water table depth you can see has kept dropping in the village. Which means, as and when water was required, people took it. In 2005, it so and that, and also the technology has been improving, right? Today you can get a nice uh, bore well pump, you know, few thousand rupees. It can go, you know, go down uh, what? Uh, 40, 50, 60, 100 meters, it'll go down and pull water out. So as, as my water dries up, I just keep going deeper and deeper until one day I can't get water. And that was the situation in 2005. Next. Okay, so you can see the, these are all the shallow wells. Blue. Next one. All these are the bore wells. It increased. So now we are in 2002. Okay, I'm oh, sorry, yeah, all the bore wells. Next. And again, post 2002, 
all the yielding wells suddenly went off because all those wells were didn't have water so now you are in the village you i mean i think nagesh can extend on this i think this is the situation he faced 2005 he didn't have water to to kind of get his fields going yeah next and and please realize there are there is rainfall but the rainfall is probably not used properly if there is rainfall it's not used properly it just the surface water runs off so the civil engineers what would you do if the surface water runs off how would you make sure the surface water gets into the ground water what what would the civil engineers do how do you recharge the ground water so i have good rains for example we had excellent rains in chennai does it mean all our ground water is recharged yes in this particular case yes because the rain was so good but if i only had 5 days of rain okay and uh, and I, the water didn't get recharged where would the water go it would flow off into the sea or flow off into the river and go off it's wasted so i need to recharge the ground water when i have an opportunity and that recharge is done through check dams through being being able to fill my lakes holding the rock so where you locate these dams become important if i locate a check dam in a nice rock where the soil is nice and rocky what happens the water does not percolate okay so when i go to a place i'll have to look at what the you know where should my check dam i can locate a check dam where the the there is no drainage channel i only get rain water that falls in it and stops it's again not a point i need to locate check dams where there is a set of criteria i have to be able to identify this criteria next okay so as we go on you will find again the sustainability concept you know if we keep destroying and we are not able to do you know keep all extracting we will only be left with google earth which i think many many people seem to be happy with it okay okay next slide so here what we talked about is a water harvesting so here you can see a kind of a water harvesting structure check dam with water retained behind it if i can locate enough of these in the village then when it rains my ground water will get recharged and i will have much much more sustained use of the water rather than it running off into not the sea there but into areas where i can't use it so the challenge is so if if we go back uh, and ask you know how do i locate a check dam when do i locate it where what happens will will so our challenge has become to be able to find a not only a suitable place but also there are other challenges in locating a check dam so we'll address some of these challenges next please okay so this is something which we discussed if i if i locate a check dam in the wrong place this is what i land up with if it's a right place i get water obviously in order to be able to locate it if i don't use social and technical appropriate social and technical factors i will land up with that kind of an issue i think most of you can relate to technical factors okay even i as an engineer can relate to technical factors to locate a check dam what are the social factors okay so this is where you have to understand how our villages work if i am a big land owner in a village i will tell the pwd locate the check dam next to my field okay social status becomes important the pwd engineer will locate the check dam next to the big landlord's field does it benefit the village no does the uh, small land owner realize that there is something gone wrong no probably only after everything has been constructed they will do it so one of the things we wanted to do is try to bring in what we call collaborative or people participation in this check dam process how do we get a bunch of people together and let up them to participate in how the check dam is located next please so when we look at this we need technical micro watershed features agricultural requirements kind of technical and socio cultural factors these factors have to be brought in to find out where we are going to locate the check dam next okay and we have like i just said it requires participation of people without people participation if i go in independently as an engineer and locate the check dam one people might not use the water effectively because they don't even know where it is what it is i have not addressed the needs of the community i need community to participate next so 
this fact that community should participate in a in a in a issue like this is is fairly well documented okay there are there are techniques called participatory rural appraisal participatory mapping all of these techniques have been there for several years so if i'm going to do developmental studies in a region i have to bring participation of the community and the, there are techniques but what we wanted to try and when uh, nagesh said look the, all these things happen but even in a meeting like this people do not visualize what is happening they cannot see whatever the headman of the village says or whatever the most the person with the highest status says is what is done there isn't real participation so our kind of approach was to see can we use geographic information system technology to be able to improve participation what does the gis technology do it basically allows people to visualize what is happening in the spatial domain where is my farm located where are you going to locate the check dam where is the typical drainage channel in this area if i locate this here what will happen if i locate that that will happen perform different scenarios and be able to do different things for example okay uh, i mean how many of you use google map almost everybody right what do you use google map for for finding finding an address or things like that okay now before before there was google map what would you have done address telephone book okay maybe we had yellow pages very briefly but now anything you want you go to google map right so you can say that this is almost like developing a google map for the villagers we are telling them oh this is where your farmland is this is where the water comes this is where this is going to happen that is where this is going to happen if i take this route if i leave at this time you know how long it's going to take you from point a to point b you know alternate routes we want to provide a similar environment for them not a google map but but basically metaphorically speaking is a similar environment for them to be able to take a look at how they have alternatives they have next please okay so what we are saying is basically a participatory gis based community decision support system so you can see here this is one of the meetings which nagesh had we'll actually be projecting the map the the community will get around it they will start saying what would happens if i do this what happens if i do there will i be able to do this and through the simulations in the map you are actually able to show them what happens and then their participation increases nagesh will show you some of those results you know how things will move next please okay now i'm getting into a into a into a little more uh, nagesh i think for time time we can i think we can skip it how many of you are familiar with geographic information systems do you have do you have a subject on gis no okay so might be uh, might be what we can do is uh, I think I think because of the change in computer there is a little bit of a <clears throat> So what I'm going to do is spend a couple of minutes in explaining to you what a GIS is that is an area in which uh, I have done a lot of work on on uh, how do we actually use a GIS for different applications and for in every year the technology changes the technology becomes in fact in that years we've been working together itself our gps has moved from something that is this big okay taking it to the field and doing a gps to the cell phone okay the the processing power of uh, what do you say your your the, the phones we use today is more than the pcs we used to take to the lab, to the field 10 years ago so there are there's a lot of change that's happened but uh, i think for, i for the benefit of those who are not familiar with the gis i think one of the things i can do is kind of explain what the gis is 